It's a two-story, so but this uh, it's a military. Mm -hmm. C, C5. Okay. It is so good to see Gloria. Oh my goodness! I've got all y'all conversations at the house. I forgot to bring them up to the call bell. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so trying to prepare her for the movie this. That was in it. Oh, that was in it. I'm going to go to Germany. He said, no, I don't want you here because you're a bond. Okay. So then they're going to go to Spain. No, you think it's going to Spain. Then they're going to Liberia. No, I can't say that. Now they're going to Johnson Island. I'm going to go to Johnson Island. I'm going to go to Johnson Island. Yeah, right. Yeah. And then they're going to go to Johnson Island. Couple of times. Yeah, we're up to 10 30. How do they make out? Well, I don't know. I got, I got 100 pages oh. to go yet. <laughs> well, you let me know next yeah. week because it can't be a Let me know how they make out. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh. Welcome to it. A retired men's and women's club of Greater Rochester on this beautiful spring morning. Hallelujah, it's finally starting to be spring around here. All right. Good morning. 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 I'm waiting to see what you suggest for me to do for others and how to serve you best. I'm ready now to follow. If you'll take the lead, then I can say at sunset, it was a good day indeed. It was written by Anna M. Matthews. Please stand for our Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I uh, like to welcome uh, a few of our guests. I think I see Mary Grant came and visited us. She was here before. Welcome, Mary. And then our speaker, Maureen Whalen, who's going to talk, give a presentation on aviatrix. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's what I can say. <laughs> I look forward to do that. Uh, attendance count? Oh, oh it's our turn. 15, 16, 18, 18. 19. 19. Good. What are the kids? Thanks, Craig. <laughs> um, any old business? Um, the old business. I could put underneath this our luncheon. Uh, we'll be next week on the 20th at the Olive Garden in Greece on Ridge or off of Ridge. And it'll be 11.30 a.m. I called and made reservations last week at Warren's house. He can verify that I did it. <laughs> and uh, I made it for 18 people. And it'll be at 11.30. And if you go in there, uh, if you get there before I am, before I will, because I don't know when I'm going to get there. Um, uh, give who you are, and then it's under my name. Walt Eisenzell from Retired Men's and Women's Club, okay? Uh, I don't know, some places they wait till all the party comes in to seat you, and other places seat uh, as they come in. So I don't know how they work it there. But, uh, that you can find out for yourself. But it is at the Olive Garden next week at 11.30 a.m. Okay. Any other old any other old business? Okay, I guess we'll move to the, any new business. Okay. Um, committee reports. I guess the our secretary or acting secretary is up today, so... Um, John? 231.65. Thanks, John. 231.65. And 
and uh, I guess that's the committee reports. Uh, Jack, sunshine report, humor. Uh, it's way too early for this. <laughs> okay, Jack, that's good. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> that's the right there. He is. Well, it's going to be short and snappy because I don't have anything to report on the membership. Uh, no one has contacted me. I haven't been told anybody's out until with any major problems. So we're going to skip that and we'll go into the, uh, the humor part. Now, this is way too early. So I, I decided I would tell two of these, a preliminary to the main event. Again, from the laughter I hear in the back, I expect spontaneous results from these. Don't hide it, you know. You know let loose. Beautiful. Let's just sing the first verse of it. Uh, 
it's on page two. It's a big print. I can even read it from way back here. <laughs>
No, you don't want to block the screen. They can't see. Yeah, that's good. Uh-huh. I'll play Hoyas with the closers. Is this better? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, okay. Benji, maybe it's a little bit on the weak side. It's like getting up early in the morning and trying to get here quickly, you know? Anyway, uh, so I always a pleasure to have a, a, be a, a, a chairman of the group. Uh, you meet so many interesting people from all walks of life. But we've had them from one day to another, and there's so many good people out there doing things that are so worthwhile. And if you pick up the newspaper, you're never sure what's going on or whether it's safe to walk out on some days. But anyway, if you listen to all the news, it's supposed to be good. But anyway. New York, New York Times used, used to say, we, we, all the news is good. Well, uh, it changed since then, I guess. Anyway, but anyway, the first time I ever met our speaker, I think, was uh, at the museum in, in, out in Greece, and she's been very active uh, as a part of uh, getting that thing going, and uh, quite a story behind all that, which I won't try to tell you about, but uh, those of you who live in Greece know the story, how they moved uh, the two largest houses all the way down uh, Long Pond Road, or uh, to where it is now, this is the museum. Anyway, uh, time we really got fully acquainted with our speaker was uh, when she gave me a call to, I wanted to know if I'd like to come and tell a little story about my time in World War II and they're making up a story about it. I actually made a book up and the book's got about uh, oh, uh, how many pages I think it's got, it's got about seven people who were actually left from World War II so I have to be one of them fortunately <laughs> and uh, so, uh, she interviewed me and, and uh, we put on a recording and made up a recording for it and uh, so we and then they put the article in the book and also had on display for two or three months out there in, in uh, the museum and for people to see. I think Wally was so excited about the book. He, we bought the book, it was about a $14 book, but the beautiful book with pictures, a picture of me was obviously in it when I was in Hawaii, uh, my Navy outfit, and also uh, my wife's anyway, and uh, also uh, the time when uh, I had a chance to talk to uh, General Colin Powell about how things were going. Uh, mm -hmm. He's going to be running for president. But anyway, uh, uh, I enjoyed it. my being interviewed by Colleen. She, uh, she had a very technique of how to do it, mm -hmm. just how to do it, and uh, to finish the job. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to tell you she's a great citizen of Greece and been there for a while, and uh, is a wonderful, wonderful, sweet lady. And you're going to love her. And you're going to be interested to hear what she's talking about. And she's going to. She came in on, on the on the helicopter today. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, my house, and uh, so she's going. She landed here just in time to. Massachusetts, 
and graduated from Fort Edward Collegiate in Fort Edward, New York. I was an only child and a spoiled brat. And probably if I had lived in this generation, I would have been a delinquent or something because I was always looking for kicks. I got my first car when I was 13. My family bought me a single cylinder Cadillac. I raced around the streets of Rochester at 30 miles an hour. There were no auto licenses then. I was the first female driver in Rochester. City Council called a special meeting to try to stop me, but there was no law to cover the circumstances. After leaving school, I became very much interested in automobiles. Five or six men had driven from New York City to San Francisco under the most trying circumstances. And they told how they toiled and suffered and all that sort of thing and the troubles they had in the books they wrote afterwards. And I convinced the Overland people that that was no way to get people to buy automobiles. <laughs> that I should get up some morning in New York and say, well, it's a very nice day. I think I'll take my Overland and drive to San Francisco. And that was in May, 1910. Well, they, the Willis Overland Company of Toledo, agreed with me. They were anxious to interest women in learning to drive. There were very few women who drove in those days. So consequently, I set out on my trip, which, by the way, was beautifully managed, highly successful, and probably one of the first of those big promotion type things. I've spoken plenty about my trip. But there are a few incidents that uh, concern my aviation career. When we drove into the outskirts of Dayton, what is now Wright Field, part of Wright-Patterson Field, we ran into something really historic. It was the first time in aviation history that two planes were up over the same field at the same time. The flyers were Wilbur Wright and Al Welch, the first Wright student. Never before had there been such an exhibition. And I can say without exaggeration that there was probably, it was a Saturday afternoon, there was probably 30,000 people there. As I sat there watching these two men up in the air, I turned to my traveling companion, Miss Phillips, and said, can you imagine anybody but anybody being crazy enough to do a thing like that, <laughs> little knowing that before the summer was over, I would be one of the crazy ones. <laughs> Near the end of our trip, when we arrived in Santa Ana, we were greeted by Glenn Martin, who at that time was one of the biggest Overland distributors in Southern California. Poor Glenn had to shake hands with his left hand because his right was in a sling. He was one of the great pioneer aviators on the West Coast, and he had been flying a plane he built, cracked up, and broken his arm. Little did I suspect that in about two years, I would become a test pilot for the planes he built. I've often thought during the many years I knew Martin that he never changed in his appearance. He was tall and slim, wore horn rimmed glasses, and looked like a divinity student. When we stopped in San Diego, a young Associated Press correspondent called on me at the hotel with what seemed to be a fabulous suggestion. There was a man by the name of Henry Roig, who owned a couple of planes based in Mexico, just across the border. The AP man thought that it would be a wonderful idea if I went up as a passenger in uh, Roig's big Farnham biplane, which to me was nothing more than a huge canvas and piano wire kite attached to a motor. <laughs> the AP man thought that since I was the first woman to drive across the continent, that it would make a good feature story if I became the first woman to ride across the border in an airplane. I was crazy enough to think this was a fine idea. 
So on a Saturday morning, we drove down to the flying field to discuss it with Mr. Rowan. In those days, due to the fragile construction of planes, flying was done as much as possible at sunrise or sundown when there was little or no wind. We made the arrangements and drove back to San Diego with the understanding that we would return late in the afternoon to make the flight. Alas, when we returned, we discovered the big plane in a heap of cloth, wire, and sticks in the middle of the flying field. And there was no possibility of making the flight in the smaller single-seater plane. Our consternation was even greater when the AP man confessed to what he had done. In order to make the Sunday newspapers all around the country, he had to file his story in New York by Saturday evening. And because of the three hour time difference between San Diego and New York, he had already written and sent in his story. <laughs> if it was discovered that the flight had never taken place, it would cost our young friend his job. We went into a huddle. The four of us, the AP man, Roig, Miss Phillips, and myself, agreed to keep the whole thing a deep, dark secret to save the man's job. To tell the truth, I was relieved. I had been scared since early in the morning when they made the arrangements. Not having to make the flight was like coming out of a bad dream and having a ton of lead lifted off my chest. After the Overland trip, I returned to New York City. And you must understand, as I said at the beginning, I was a very spoiled brat, very young and very stupid about many things. I had had all this newspaper stuff, no radio or television, of course, but I had had all this newspaper stuff due to the press agent I had nothing to do with me. And I got back to New York and everything was dead. No one paid any attention to me and I didn't like it at all. I had met the Glenn Curtis press agent, Frank Tipton, and he said to me, how would you like to learn to fly? And I said, well, I don't know. I hadn't given it any thought. Why not? You know what it's all about, he said. You were up in the air recently near San Diego. <laughs> so there I was, caught in my own lie. The San Diego AP man would still lose his job if the truth came out. Maybe it would be a good idea, I stammered. So to cut the thing short, three days later, the Curtis company called me, and I went into the office and talked to Jerome Fanchuli, who at that time was the manager of the Curtis New York office, as well as the manager of their exhibition flying team. Mr. Curtis was out of town. I walked out with a contract in my hand to go to Hammondsport to learn to fly. I was scared and thrilled at the same time, but uh, Mr. Curtis didn't want to teach a girl to fly, and he was so perfectly right, it wasn't even funny. At that early stage of aviation, when anything could happen, and often did, to have a woman killed or crippled would have seriously retarded aviation. But that's not the way I saw it. I have a contract, I said. Mr. Fanchuli signed me up, and you gave him carte blanche to do what he thought best. If Mr. Curtis was stubborn, I was willful. <laughs> My fear was forgotten in the face of opposition. I have a piece of paper that says, you're going to teach me to fly, and doggone it, I'm going to learn, I said. So there I was with a reluctant instructor a quiet, self-contained, almost silent man, teaching me to fly against his will and better judgment. By the way, I was the only woman Mr. Curtis ever taught to fly. I don't think he ever had the heart to teach another one. <laughs> there is no way that someone could take you up in the airplane and teach you to fly. The planes were a single-seat affair. Well, you've seen pictures of them. You sat out in front in what we call the undertaker's chair. Because if you did crack up, 
the motor always broke loose and smashed you in the back of the head. And that ended your career forever. Not as a pilot, just plain forever. <laughs> they started me in on grass cutting, which we didn't know any better was very dangerous. Grass cutting was the term used at the time for taxiing up and down the field to become familiar with the controls. To keep the plane on the ground, a governor was put on the motor, so it couldn't develop enough power to really fly. Mr. Curtis explained the controls to me and told me to get up into the seat. It wasn't until then, when I thought of climbing into that seat three feet off the ground, that I became embarrassingly aware of my clothes. I had worn a beautifully tailored suit with a wide pleated skirt, ankle length, and about four yards in circumference at the helm. Before I knew what was happening, I was being lifted into the seat, and I kept sputtering. Even if it's just grass cutting, there's enough wind to blow my skirt up over my head. The future of women in the air was assisted by a mechanic who came riding down the field on a bicycle. He calmly reached down and unhooked the clips on his trouser legs, strode over to the plane, and silently handed them to me. I gathered as much of my skirt as possible around each ankle and clamped on the clips. I was ready. I did this grass cutting for three or four days. Then one morning, I started down the field when a puff of wind coming down the valley between the hills lifted the plane into the air in spite of the governor on the motor. I went up 20, 25 feet, but it seemed like 100. All I could think of was that I wanted to get the plane down in one piece and upright. Fortunately, I was able to land the plane right side up without damaging it. But the speed mad tomboy who had gone from skates to bicycles and went crazy over automobiles had never felt like this. I had tasted blood, and from then on, there was no holding me. <laughs> Mr. Curtis insisted that a young girl could not lodge in a country hotel by herself. So it was decided that I would stay at the Curtis home. The Curtis house was on top of a hill and some distance from the flying field. Having recently finished the automobile trip, I strenuously objected to walking back and forth. I was used to traveling on my seat, not my feet. So Mr. Curtis, who was still manufacturing motorcycles then, told me to go down to the motorcycle factory. It, if I could ride a motorcycle, and get a motorcycle, which I did. And I was fine as long as I was on it. It was having to stop. My legs were too short. When I stopped, I fell off into the dirt. So I learned to ride up next to a building, put out my hand against it, and just very gracefully just know. Mr. Curtis had just won the first big international air race in France a few months before, so he had many famous visitors, and among them was Alberto Santos Dumont. I knew that Monsieur Santos Dumont was visiting, and that afternoon when I left the flying field and headed back to the Curtis house, I could see Mr. Santos Dumont and Mr. Curtis sitting on the front porch. Well. I just usually fell off the motorcycle in front of the Curtis house. But I thought, my dignity won't let me do that. So I had it all figured out. There was a nice big tree there, and I would ride up slowly next to it, put out my hand, and just very gracefully dismount. That was the plot. But it didn't work out that way. I turned on the accelerator accidentally in the excitement and hit the tree head on. Oh. I went head over heels over the handlebars and landed right square in front of the front porch. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Monsieur Santos Dumont was the first man to reach me and he helped me up. And he turned to Mr. Curtis and said, this little lady doesn't need airplanes to fly. She flies by herself. <laughs> Meanwhile, back on 
the field, I had reached the hopping stage. Each day I hopped higher and higher into the air. But oh, how I wanted to go up and really fly and circle the field. I mentally cussed myself for promising Mr. Curtis that I wouldn't do it without his permission. And I dutifully kept that promise until September 2nd, 1910. That day I started off supposedly for just a hop down the field and instead went sailing into the air. I went up to 150 feet, took two turns around the field and landed with ease. That was my first real solo flight. When I landed, I expected to hear a severe scolding from Mr. Curtis. Instead, he seemed very much pleased. He didn't congratulate me. There was no fuss, no feathers, no scolding. He just treated it as a matter of course, as I did. But from then on, they couldn't keep me out of the air. For some unknown reason, I developed a peculiar quirk. I don't know why, but I found it very difficult to bank the plane when making a turn. I sort of skidded around in the air, which was probably the most dangerous thing I could do. Not only Mr. Curtis, but all of the aviators who visited the field from time to time kept trying to explain and impress on me the importance of banking. That's what the ailerons are for, they kept telling me. By the way, Mr. Curtis invented the flaps, as we call them today. Then they were called ailerons. In spite of all that was said to me, I still found it very difficult to convince myself that when that plane tipped, it wasn't going to slide down to the ground. One day, I made up my mind that definitely, definitely, the next time I went up, I would bake the plane, if only to prove that skidding was much better. <laughs> I took off from the upper end of the field and flew a few feet beyond the edge of Lake Cayuga. Then I banked. And then I banked again to complete the turn, but I banked too much. Right then, I made my own prediction come true because the plane slid down into the water, crumpling the two left wings. Needless to say, that caused quite a commotion. Mr. Curtis came running to the edge of the shore, white-faced and angry. He called out to me, Blanche, are you hurt? I was half crying, mad at myself, and coming to the realization of how stupid I had been. I also felt some pain in my left ankle. I was sitting there on the seat as the plane rested in the shallow water. I called back, no, I'm not hurt. I just broke my damn ankle. Not only was my little accident talked about in the village, worse still, my reply to Mr. Curtis was repeated on every corner. Women just did not swear in public in those days. Mrs. Lena Curtis was a very prim and proper person. Needless to say, to have a guest in her home screaming swear words on the lake was humiliating, and she didn't hesitate to let me know about it. It took me a while before I could work my way back into her good graces. The result of the incident disturbed me for some time. Not that I was sorry for having cussed on the waters of Lake Cayuga, but I regretted causing Mrs. Curtis any embarrassment. I had developed a great respect for the little lady. All the aviation inventors formed their own exhibition flying teams. It was a way of attracting attention to the planes they built. In October 1910, I went to Chicago in Fort Wayne, Indiana with the Curtis exhibition flying team. We were called the Curtis Crew. We did exhibition flying. Now that was not barnstorming. 
I didn't fly in Chicago, but on October 23, 1910, uh, at Fort Wayne, Indiana, I made my first professional flight and became the first woman to fly solo in public. I went up to 12 feet. I believed I could have made a turn around the field, but Mr. Curtis absolutely forbade me attempting any turns until I had perfected the straightaway flights. But um, that was it for me for a while. The next day, I married Harry Tuttle, who was the press agent on my transcontinental trip earlier in the year. Don't ever marry your press agent. <laughs> they make lousy husbands. <laughs> Harry was a social snob. When I could take the drinking and promiscuity of his social crowd no more, I packed my bags and returned to Rochester. <laughs> I wanted to get back into flying and had to persuade my family to let me try again. They were greatly opposed to it, especially my mother. She didn't feel about flying the way she felt about the Overland trip. My mother, whom I frequently like to tell was as crazy as I was, was delighted with the whole idea of the drive and encouraged me in every way. I often thought that I did the things she would have liked to have done if she hadn't been born too early. But she never reconciled herself to my flying. I could go back to Mr. Curtis because by getting married, I had broken my contract. I wrote a letter to the Wright brothers, and they wanted no part of a woman <laughs> exhibition pilot. But Captain Thomas Baldwin wanted me. A girl pilot? I wasn't going to be competing with the men. I was going to be a star being a woman. You know what I mean, being the only woman. So in the summer of 1911, I went to Mineola, Long Island, enjoyed Captain Baldwin. I remember telling reporters at the time, Captain Baldwin just said that he wouldn't mind starting a class for girls. He thinks women would make good flyers, that they are cool and more careful than men. They might faint afterwards, but they kept their heads in a crisis, and often they had better judgment than men. Well, you just quote the captain about the better judgment. I don't say that. I believe that women have cool heads. And although on the Overland trip, I was pictured as a rampant suffragette, placing women far above men and all that, I really am old fashioned enough to think that if there's a man to fall back on, to fall on him. <laughs> but if I have to depend on myself, I do it. That's all. I'm very conventional. It doesn't take nerve to fly. It's a love of excitement that makes people want to fly. That isn't bravery. I don't think it takes nerve at all. There are some people who enjoy a bit of a thrill to get into danger. I'm like that. I like any kind of excitement. There were two other women at Mineola that summer, Harriet Quimby and Matilda Moisson. They were both very much the great ladies. They were busy being important while I was busy having a good time. We were rivals. No two of us were on speaking terms, and each of us tried to go one better than the other. Harriet Quimby flew a monoplane. And I flew a Baldwin Meadow biplane called the Red Devil. The competitions between us usually took place at sundown. Miss Quimby might fly the longer distance, but I would win the speed honors. Monoplanes were pretty, but give me a machine that will go fast. The Baldwin biplane could go 60 miles an hour. Harriet Quimby was the first woman to fly across the English Channel, and she was the first American woman to get a pilot's license. I never got one. They were just starting to issue licenses at that time, and Glenn Curtis said they didn't amount to much, so I never bothered to get one. You had to get one through the Aero Club of America, and it was just a racket, we thought. It was I, however, and not Harriet Quimby, 
who became the first woman to make a long distance flight. It occurred by happenstance. I arrived at the flying field at sunrise that particular day and soon got into an argument with Captain Baldwin. I don't remember what the dispute was about, but I do remember I got very mad. I climbed into my Red Devil and took off. In those days, we usually flew from Mineola to the flying field at NASA Boulevard, a distance of about two miles. Because I was mad, I took off in the opposite direction and kept going straight. By the time I got around to looking down, I saw that I was over Central Islip. And for the first time that morning, I became concerned about the gas supply and decided to start back. When I had been gone 30 minutes, Captain Baldwin and some of the newsmen began phoning the various police stations to learn if an airplane crash had been reported. I remember when I returned to the field a full 45 minutes after taking off, everyone was scanning the skies. As soon as I landed, the newsmen rushed up to the plane and asked me how far I had gone. I told them I had gone as far as Central Islip. Even then, it never dawned on me that I had set a record. I was just working off a mad. <laughs> The next morning, I was surprised when I opened the newspaper and saw my picture. The headline said that I was the first woman to make a long-distance flight. The uh, trip from Mineola to Central Islip and back was about 60 miles total. Captain Baldwin never mentioned the fact that I put his plane at risk during the flight. I guess he was happy with the publicity I received. One day that same summer at Mineola, I was up in a two-seater biplane with George Beatty, and we were playing grabbing the strut. George was the pilot, and as usual, we sat on a, out in the open on a small seat without a safety belt. In this game, the pilot would do every maneuver of which he was capable to try to make the passenger reach up and grab the wing strut to keep from falling out of the plane. When we landed, the airfield manager came up to George to tell him that it was dangerous to fly the way he had with a lady passenger. George said, hell, that's no lady, that's Blanche Stewart Scott. <laughs> I've always treasured that incident. It meant that I was an accepted member of the flying fraternity. I do want to say one thing. I don't know how long women have been driving, but you still hear that old familiar woman driver. <laughs> when the fact is that most of the people I know, the women drive better than the men. I'm just speaking about the people I know. I've never heard that in aviation. <laughs> I've never heard that in aviation. You were a good pilot or a poor pilot. And I've talked about this with people, including Chuck Yeager, who broke the supersonic wall. I've ridden with him. He's a doll. And I've discussed it with others. And you never hear woman pilot, ever. Now, you can teach almost anyone to play the piano, but you can't make everybody a musician. And it's the same with aviation. You cannot make an adult who doesn't have a certain something a pilot. You either have it or you don't have it. And those that have it make pilot. Not everyone approved of women in aviation in those days. <clears throat> you should have seen some of the letters we got. If God had intended you to fly, he would have given you wings. I hope you fly in hell. <laughs> was my busiest year for flying. I had settled down in Rochester for a quiet winter with my mother when I received uh, a telegram in late December 1911 from the promoter of the International Aviation Meets at Dominguez Fields in Los Angeles. I couldn't resist. 
especially when he offered to pay my way to Los Angeles and provide a Martin biplane for me to fly. I took the train to the West Coast. Because I didn't have a pilot's license, I wasn't allowed to compete in East Coast meets, but the Aero Club of America rules weren't as strictly enforced west of the Rockies. I don't think I'm being immodest if I say that I became the darling of the meet. I won almost $5,000 there. Lincoln Beachy, however, won the most money. There's no question that Lincoln Beachy was the outstanding pilot prior to World War I. For one thing, he was the only man I have ever known or heard of who flew a plane inside a building. Lincoln had a peculiar personality. I think he was shy. When a person first met him, you couldn't get him to say much. If you asked him a question or were just being friendly, you had to dig the conversation out of him. But once he got to know and trust you, you literally couldn't shut him up. <laughs> I once borrowed a sweater from Lincoln Beachy and never gave it back because it became my lucky red sweater. <laughs> While at Dominguez Fields, I reconnected with Glenn Martin. You recall I met him at the end of the Overland trip. Glenn liked my flying and signed me to his exhibition flying team, which was called the Great Western Flying Circus. He gave me a year's contract. Our next exhibition was in February at Oakland. And it was here that they first dubbed me Tomboy of the Air. And oh, that hurt my feelings terribly. <laughs> I didn't fly long distances or um, stay up in the air a long time during these shows. I would do a few stunts and rolls. I did one spiral roll that had Glenn Martin shaking his head. I added a steep almost vertical power off dive to my bag of tricks in 1912 and thus became the first female stunt pilot. <laughs> this flying required great physical endurance. I was exhausted after 15 minutes. Even the men staggered off the field sometimes. <laughs> in March we were in Sacramento and on the last day, March 16th, I was doing my specialty act. After climbing to 2,000 feet, I retarded the throttle and eased the plane into a steep dive, intending to pull up in front of the grandstand at about 400 feet. However, the carburetor flooded, and the engine died when I attempted to apply power again. I kept the nose of the plane down until just before I reached the ground. Then I pulled back on the throttle and leveled off. I couldn't stop myself from making a hard landing, badly damaging the tail section, and shaking the engine loose from its moorings. I walked away from that landing only because I was wearing my lucky red sweater. <laughs> from time to time, Glenn Martin would visit his factory in Los Angeles. Planes were produced on a one-by-one -one basis. Whenever one was being tested, Martin would take me with him. And that's how I became the first female test pilot. Martin would take the plane up to make sure that there were no major defects. Then he'd turn it over to me. I would fly it to get the bugs out. If we didn't hear any funny noises, we'd go into the hangar and draw up a blueprint. I understand it's not done that way anymore. At the end of June 1912, Martin and I went east for the third Boston Aviation Meet that was going to be held at Squantum Fields from June 30th through July 6th. Because the Aero Club of America refused to sanction this meet, I wasn't prohibited from participating. About mid-afternoon on July 1st, Harriet Quimby took off and flew out to the lighthouse. I was up in the air at the same time. She came back in and made too fast of a turn and fell out of the plane 
and along with her passenger, plunged down into the ocean and was killed. People swarmed out onto the field from the bleachers and the sidelines. I had been circling overhead, high enough so as not to interfere with her in any way. There wasn't a single spot where I could land my plane. I tried four times, and each time, no one would budge to open a place where I could come down. Each time I tried to land, I had to open the throttle and fight for my life to get back in the air again. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Someone finally got some sense and cleared the runway. I landed just as the plane was running out of fuel, and I promptly fainted. Some newspapers reported that I was going to quit flying, but I told them the next day, although yesterday's accident was horrible and for a time unnerved me, I will not give up flying. I went out right away again the next day. You had to do that in those days if you were going to stick. I remember when I walked out onto the flying field to get into my plane, a deathly silence hit it. The people stopped talking, the band stopped playing, I said the flag stopped waving. It was a horrible sensation. But I went up and I was fine. The next day I was called into the mayor's office. Aviation, the mayor told me, is too dangerous for women. Flying is something that only daredevil men should undertake. Women aren't fitted for it temperamentally or physically. What would you suggest, I asked. It seems to me, said the mayor, that settlement work or the legal or medical profession or others that benefit humanity as a whole should engage their attention. That mayor was John Fitzgerald, our current president, John Kennedy's grandfather. I wonder if that same kind of thinking prevented the United States from putting the first woman into space. I am very upset about this Russian woman. I think it hurt us from a prestige standpoint. Because remember, the Russians claim this woman hadn't flown a plane of any kind. And she gets up, goes around, and does wonderful things. I think it's very unfair that they let the Russians get ahead of us. We should have been first. Now we're second rate again. After Boston, I returned to California and continued to fly for Martin, but it wasn't the same. My agent tried to arrange some special events. In October, I, I had a special plan to um, fly over the United States Naval Fleet in New York Harbor during its week of maneuvers, and I was going to bombard the ship with rose petals. But I was denied permission because I didn't have a pilot's license. By 1913, the novelty and excitement of flying was beginning to wane with audiences. They only came to shows hoping to see someone get killed. <laughs> the Curtis and Wright exposition flying teams had disbanded, and Mark was having a hard time getting bookings. There was a gentleman in Chicago, Ike Bloom, who had told me that there was always a job waiting for me with his Ward Aviation Company. I flew my first exhibition for Ward on Memorial Day, 1913. And for the first time that I could remember, I didn't wear my lucky red sweater. I took off for my first exhibition flight from the fairground. And uh, after climbing to 200 feet, I was preparing to make a right turn when the throttle wire snapped. The torque of the propeller twisted the plane, and I dove no surfs into a swamp at the edge of the flying field. I was thrown about 30 feet from the plane and broke 41 bones in my body. All of my ribs were broken. All the bones in my right hand were broken. There were three breaks in my forearm. My collarbone was smashed, and my right shoulder blade was shattered into eight pieces. My left arm came out of its socket, and uh, my left elbow was fractured. I spent the entire summer of 1913 in the full cast at the Sherman Hotel. That put an end to my exhibition flying career, 
and I gave up flying entirely in 1916. It just about broke my heart, but it made my mother happy. I once heard Errol Halsey, wonderful man, give a speech on Governor's Island for the unveiling of a monument to the early birds. And he said something that I thought was very wonderful. He said that he thought that every person in the United States, oh, by the way, I'm going to brag. I was an early bird because I flew before 1916. He said that he thought every man, woman, and child should know who the early birds were and what they did because 65% of them laid down their lives to build a runway for the United States Air Force. And I thought that was a very wonderful tribute. Then the story is expecting me. I have to fly now. Good day. <laughs> Has any new, new information come out about Amelia Earnhardt? Not that I know of. Oh. Not that I know of. Um, Blanche was a good 20 years before Amelia Earhart. Oh, I see. Now, Amelia Earhart would have been a barnstormer. Barnstormer, they actually flew their planes from one place to another. In Blanche's day, the, uh, they would never be able to fly that long. They would have to dismantle their planes and send them from one place to another by train. So now I'm Maureen, I'm not Blanche, and I can tell you the truth about her. <laughs> one thing about Blanche Stewart Scott is the information that we have about her is mostly from herself. She wrote an autobiography that was never published. She was, um, she was interviewed by, by another author for uh, a book on early aviators, uh, again, that remained unpublished. I first encountered her because the um, town of Greece, uh, um, well, the historian's office, which used to be um, with the Greece Historical Society at the beginning of this year, um, Bill Rylick separated them. So, um, but the historian's office had actual um, recordings of Blanche talking about her life. So, um, my talk to you, probably 97% uh, of what I said are her own words. But Blanche never let the facts get in the way of a good story. <laughs> So um, you have to take some of the things that she said with a grain of salt. When did she actually stop flying? 1916. Oh, it was 16. 1916, right. She had her own so plane. She, she had her own plane. So she was uh, even a little bit before Lindbergh then? Oh, yes. Yes. Early birds, everyone before 1916. And, and you don't hear a lot about these people because so many of them died in plane crashes. You know, Blanche was one of the few that survived. Her good friend, Lincoln Beachy, he died in a plane crash. Um, uh, George Beatty, however, he, he lasted almost as long as, as Blanche. What about the other girls you mentioned with, with flying with Blanche? Uh, Matilda Moissant, uh, Harry Quimby, of course, died in, in, in Boston. Matilda Moissant, she gave up flying uh, after uh, Harry Quimby crashed. So she was born um, on a farm. Um, you, some of you know where Rochester Products is on Lexington Avenue? Okay, that's where the Scott farm was, her grandparents, and that's where she was born. Uh, but she was raised in Rochester. Um, her father married late, so um, uh, he died probably when she was around 18. Now, Blanche was born in the year 1885 but she lied about her age her entire life. She always made out that uh, she was born in 1892. She didn't want people to know that when she made the transcontinental trip and started flying that she was not, she said she was 18. She was actually 25 at that time. Um, so um, everything is a little bit skewed when she talks about it. So she said she got her first car when she was 13 it's not possible, um, because the first Cadillac didn't come out of the factory until 1902. Um, so uh, she was probably closer to just out of high school 
Her father died at the, um, the end of 1903, so I'm, I'm thinking she probably got it when she was around 18, not 13. Um, she was also not the first woman to drive across the continent. She was actually the second. Now, I'm not sure if she ever knew that she was not the first. Certainly when she drove, made the trip, um, all the newspapers reported that she was the first. And I'm not quite sure why, because just the year previously, they had, they had reported on Alice Ramsey, who was actually the first woman to drive across the continent unaccompanied by a man. Um, but, but right up until, um, well, she made, she uh, did these interviews in 1963, in August of 1963, she always continued to say that she was the first woman uh, to drive across the continent. Um, She died um, in 1970, so it was right, be she was about three months shy of her 85th birthday. So she was right there at the beginning of aviation, and she lived long enough to see a man walk on the moon. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, she, um, Chuck Yeager, as she mentioned, um, she was the first woman to ride in a jet, and it was Chuck Yeager who took her up. Oh my and yes. And because he knew that she used to be a stunt pilot, he didn't just take her on a flight. He, he did lots of the uh, of air stunt flight. He was there. She loved it. However, she was scared to death during her first helicopter ride. Helicopter. Mm -hmm. She didn't like the helicopter ride. Did she, did she ever see people jump out of planes? Did she ever go up in a plane and see people jump out of them? No, no. Yeah. Not that she ever mentioned. Not that she ever mentioned. As a, as a side light, to some of that story you were telling, uh, it's always been my opinion that Glenn Curtis did more for the aviation industry than the Wright brothers ever did. Oh, yes, absolutely. And Blanche would agree with you. And the other thing is that I, I, I think that mechanic you were talking about was a fellow by the name of Otto Heckler, who I had the privilege of meeting many, many years ago. Oh, really? that Glenn Curtis was responsible for. The Wright brothers had, had kind of a uh, they had to warp the wing. Lever, lever type of controls where Glenn Curtis had, he had the wheel. wheel. He had a steering wheel. Yeah, he had a steering wheel. And he could the, these flaps or air lines as they called them yeah. uh, were at the tips of the wings and they were able to work back and right. forth to make that plane back. Yeah. Rochester International Airport for a flight. I don't know if you've ever noticed that they have a plane up in the rafters. A woman is, a woman is the pilot. 
We had a supposed to be going to Stuart Scott. Oh. Go to the airport and see if that's Blanche Stuart Scott. Uh, Blanche is, is buried in uh, Riverside Cemetery, and ironically, as I said, she always lied about her age. She um, she she even went on um, Jack Carr when he was doing the CBS morning show, and um, soon as uh, she got got on, he asked her how old she was. She said, I'm 29, I've been 29 for years. <laughs> and then he asked her um, um, when she first flew and how old she was. And she said, uh, you can't trick me like that. <laughs> and then he asked her a third time how old she was. And she said, old enough to know better than to tell you. <laughs> and he, he promptly entered the, entered, uh, entered the interview. But um, she is buried in Riverside, and whoever put the um, uh, grave marker uh, list, listed her birthday as 1880, which made her five years older <laughs> than she actually was. <laughs> so, uh, didn't, get, didn't get away with that flange. Yeah, Warren? No, before we answer our question, my question, um, I, the, group, the group might be interested in knowing that uh, you take trips uh, through the cemetery of very, very historic people. Maybe sometime in the future, yeah. we could ask you to take us a trip to there in, in, in nice weather, of course. Right. Weather, May or something. Yes. But anyway. Yeah. Of, a very, of a fairly well modernized aircraft. 
Those that have it, they put it in the cockpit and take pictures. 